constructed these walls and I found a bed. Welcome to the Deconstructionist Podcast. I'm your host, John Williamson. This week, we are back with part two with my guest, Anna Gazmarian. Uh, if you haven't listened to part one yet, pause this one, go back, listen to part one first, and then come back and listen to this part. If you've already heard the first part, then awesome, you're in the right place. Uh, before we get to the episode, though, uh, again, as we mentioned last week, uh, aware of the website is, uh, is um, well, I think it's been hacked. I think it's safe to say. So we are working on getting that back up and running for those of you who like streaming directly from the website. Uh, for everyone else, uh, we are still available on all the social media platforms and all the major podcast platforms as well. Uh, in fact, we have a brand new web store that offers uh, fast shipping. Uh, in fact, for the first time, we have international shipping available uh, and tons of new designs and options. So getting back to the guest, though, Anna Gazmarian, uh, her new book, Devout, A Memoir of Doubt, uh, is an incredible book and deeply personal about her journey through an evangelical upbringing and her struggle with mental health that I think a lot of us uh, listening can identify with. So check out the book. Uh, but in the meanwhile... Enjoy part two with Anna freaking Gazmarian. Where the refugee suffers and the white man has... Because that was another thing. All my thoughts were just to be centered on God and all my thoughts were centered on being alive. And so I felt really selfish and I felt like I, I was doing the opposite of what I should be doing. And I isolated myself a lot because I just felt like... I'm not a good spiritual influence on these people and that they deserve better. Hmm. When in reality, it's like, if we, if we learned, if we've learned anything about the, the Bible as a whole, it's like, it's messy and it's intentional in the fact that it, it shows people who are not perfect far from, you know, and, and yet, yeah, there's an element where we feel like we have to live up to a certain standard. And, and that's the next question I had for you. Cause you talk about in the book, about like, sort of this revelation that you had with um, one of your therapists who really kind of focused, turned it back on you and like, well, what do you love about yourself? And you had a hard time even coming up with something and it's like, but it feels sort of selfish, yeah. you know, like, well, why would I focus on myself? Yeah. You know? So talk about like how difficult that was, but like what kind of difference did that make in your life? Like starting to focus on fixing that, that piece. Yeah, so I, I did have a therapist in Raleigh, and she did the whole John 316 thing. <laughs> Wait, is it John 316? This is so bad. This is so bad. <laughs> I'm so, what is the verse now, loving others as yourself? What verse is that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, love God with all your heart and Please love your neighbor this. as yourself. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a verse about loving your neighbor as yourself. And I feel like everything in my community was always around loving your neighbor and pouring everything into your neighbor. And I, I kept justifying it with, well, this is what Jesus did. Jesus poured himself into other people constantly, but also Jesus like went alone and cried. And I didn't really pay attention to the boundaries that Jesus yeah. set. Um, but I, I thought that I was supposed to hate myself and I thought that that was like a holy thing because uh. I thought I was supposed to see myself first and foremost as a sinner and I, that shaped everything. And I thought, I mean, all these worship songs about being undeserving and all these things, yeah. I just, it, it's so toxic. It's so toxic. And I, I remember my therapist telling me that and I was just like, that's really selfish and selfish is the worst thing you can be as a Christian. And, um, I think something that, I mean, I talk about it in my book, but it's something that came to me as I got older and I became a parent of like the idea that everyone is made in the image of God and what that means. And that makes us lovable. I mean, I think everyone and regardless of your religious stance, there's, there's a part of God in everybody. And something that really helped me was I did internal family processing work and it's, it's parts work where you think about the different parts of yourself. And for so long, I thought, okay, these are the parts of myself that I need to cut off myself from. And if I remove them from my life, I'll be better. And in reality, it's like each of these parts of myself that I hate and think that is unlovable and separate from God 
is serving a purpose in my life and it is serving a purpose in helping me survive. And I need to have compassion for those parts. So for me, like self-love and learning to love myself has been a really um, hard process. And it's something that I continue to have to learn and like redirect myself. And I think, I think allowing myself to love myself has enabled me to see and experience love in different ways that, um, point me back to God. And I think my clearest depictions of God are through other people and the way that they love me. And for so long, I couldn't really take that in because I just thought I'm undeserving. I'm undeserving. But I think learning to love myself and believe that everybody is worthy of love has enabled me to, um, experience God in a different way. Yeah. Talk about that a little bit because, I, I think a lot of times when people uh, experience s- some sort of like trauma specific to the church, like there's a couple different directions or, or different like landing places that you could end up. And a lot of people just choose to walk away entirely, but like you sort of reshaped your, your views, um, which could not have been easy um, growing up in a very specific type of, of Christianity Um it, but like having to, to work through that on top of like having to like kind of figure out who you were in light of this diagnosis, like talk about like when you started to feel sort of the breakthrough in terms of like reimagining like your views on God and the world and, and still allowing space for God despite everything you had been taught growing up. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, I think it's been a a really gradual process and there's moments where I'm like, would it be easier if I walked away? Would it like, what is keeping me attached to God? And I'm asked that a lot because when I was younger, I was like, well, maybe this is about contentment. Maybe this is about trying to get some false, a certain sense of certainty, but I'm not getting any of that. Um, I, when I was in college, I stopped going to church for a while and really the only thing that kept me going and and thinking about everything was Jesus and the suffering of Jesus and really entering into that. Because I feel like in the church spaces I was in, it was everything was always rushing to Easter and rushing to the resurrection. There was no acknowledgement of the suffering and the hopelessness and everything surrounding what led to Easter. And especially like on Holy Saturday where everyone thought everything was lost and that there was no, there was absolutely no hope. And I think I've spent a lot of my time in that space of Holy Saturday. And I think the older I've gotten because I have more experiences of God's faithfulness, I can be in those spaces and know and feel all of that pain while also knowing that there is going to be glimpses of light and um, that was something that had took a long time because I remember when I was younger and diagnosed, I, I didn't have a collection of things to recollect or memories to think about in order to get me through because at that point I was kind of questioning all of those. Um, so I think that really helped and thinking a lot about like Garden Gethsemane, like I have a Garden Gethsemane tattoo. Like I remember going to, I went to Israel and I was like, this is going to renew my faith. And then I go there and I'm just kind of repulsed by everything because it's everything is this tour trap and it's this showy thing and there's Mm. gold everywhere and everyone's in line and I just leave the lines. I'm like, I don't care about any of this. And like the God that I believe in isn't interested in the show and the God that I believe in like would not be in these spaces. Um, So then I went to Garden Gethsemane and there was like absolutely no one there and it was this really deeply spiritual thing for me of like entering the church and there's this huge mural of Jesus just sitting on the ground and everyone is off in the distance and he's completely alone. And I think that was something that I thought a lot about was just Jesus being alone and feeling alone and everyone in his life, not knowing how to be there for him in the way that he needed. And like gardening with me was something I thought a lot about where he was literally sweating blood having all these thoughts about death and all he needed was what he told his friends to do and they couldn't do it. Um, and, and so I think I just kept bringing myself back to that. And then once I got to college, I found Lamentations and that was a book that I had never heard of. And I remember even being younger, like flipping my Bible and finding a verse there and be like, what is this? And then I would just keep going because I was scared of it. Um, and so I found Lamentations. Like I did this stupid exercise where I'd be like, whatever page of the Bible I turn to, 
has a sign from God. And so I did that one day and it turned the lamentations. It's just like, what is that? Um, and so I went onto this deep dive of, of lamentations because while I found lamentations, I also had found po- poetry and lamentations is written in poetic form. And so for me, it like opened the floodgate for writing because it was like writing provides structure for things that lack meaning and understanding and beyond our comprehension and trying to find language for those things. And so I think for me, writing became my way of praying because I, I'm i still struggling to figure out like spiritual practices mm-hmm. for me because they're, they've been so tainted for me. And I, I mean, I used to think that if I didn't pray for a certain sin that I would like go to hell. I, I mean, I was like that in college. And so for me, it's like, how do I learn new spiritual practices that look different than what I was taught and fit more into who I believe God is. Um, I think a lot changed also when I had my daughter because it was like, how do I want her to experience God? And Rachel Held Evans has this book about, it's the only children's book about God that I let my daughter read. And it's has this page about God being a place of safety. And I can't get through that page mm-hmm. without crying because it's like, ultimately that's what I want. And um, my editor, when I was working on my book, he was like, what do you want readers to get to at the end? And I'm like, I want safety. And he's like, that's not an emotion. <laughs> Anna. I'm like, I know, but I want people to feel safe to like explore these things. And I think for me, like as a person, that's the most important thing is like creating these spaces of safety, um, and making people feel loved and, and accepted in where I am, <laughs> in where they are. Sorry. No, that's, that's beautiful. Um, yeah, and that's that's been the the, the mission. Uh, when my friend Adam and I started this podcast back in 2016, which is crazy to think about, um, you know, our our whole goal was only to provide a safe space for people to to ask the questions that they were sort of like deterred from asking, and to um, have a, a safe space to doubt. Even though there are clear examples, as, as you mentioned in your book, in the Bible itself you know, we've got a disciple whose nickname is Doubting Thomas. I mean, for the love of God, like, you know, and then as, as you pointed out, even Jesus, you know, when he's on the cross, there's a moment where he says, you know, God, why have you forsaken me? There's even a moment where he's doubting, you know, and it's like, and yet we have the hardest time accepting the fact that maybe that's baked into the process. You know, maybe that's a part of faith is sort of this, this wrestling with it, um, throughout our human experience. Maybe that's just part of the deal. Yeah. yeah. Um, so like talk a little bit about like as, as you're coming out of college and, and, and getting a little bit older, you said you had your daughter and that, I think that just for the parents out there, anytime there's a birth of a child that really redirects your views on the world, um, you're almost forced into a different perspective and, I found the same to be true with my daughter. It's how do I want her to be raised? You know, um, you know, how do I want to address the inevitable questions that I'll get from her at some point about God and the universe and things. And, um, so like, what are some of the things that you find, uh, that you've learned that you implement today? Um, and you know, how has it changed sort of your perspective I mean, I think she's still really young, but I still like, I mean, I'm already like thinking about purity culture and I'm like, what am I going (laughs) to teach her about that? So that's good. But as a two and a half year old, like there's something really healing for me about having a toddler and just watching her experience just this wide range of emotions and not judging herself for it, but just fully inhabiting them. I know they call it terrible twos, but I think it's (laughs) wonderful to watch that. And I... I've had so many parents and and other spaces be like, you know, you have a kid and you see how much of a sinner we innately are. And for me, it's the opposite. (laughs) I see just how much curiosity and love and purity that she has and the way in which she engages with the world. And I think the biggest thing for me is like, I think that our earliest understanding of God comes from our parents and the way in which they love us. And I think wanting to love Ezra for who she is and not who I want her to be and not what I imagine her life to be and not trying to control it, just letting her be who she is and trying to step back and and see that person separate from myself and, and wanting her to fully embrace who she is. And I also just, 
a lot of my writing and, and grappling with is like with gender dynamics and and what our idea of a Christian woman is and how we are to inhabit the world. And for me, it was very much around the male gaze and feeling like I need to be small and take up less space and have less opinions and always feeling like I could not fit that mold. And um, for whatever reason, there's just something beautiful about watching her just have a complete <laughs> freaking meltdown in Target and not caring what oh, anyone thinks. Like, yeah. I wish I could do that. Yeah, but with God, it's like... I remember spiraling with my therapist and she was just like, all you, she needs to know is like that Jesus loves her. That's all she needs to know. And I think for me, it's really important looking at the Bible from a trauma informed lens and recognizing that there's certain stories and things that I grew up with, which I don't think are going to help her understanding herself or her world, especially as a young person. And I don't want that to be Mm -hmm. infringed upon her. So like Noah's Ark, I used to have dreams all the time that God was going to punish, punish me. And so I think for right now, like, I just want her to know that she's loved and I want her to approach the world with wonder and approach God with that same amount of wonder and see God as, like I said earlier, like this safe space. And to also see her parents as a safe space to feel all the things that she's feeling and the way in which she's inhabiting the world. And I think something that I really grapple with is like, what is the line between teaching about truth and indoctrinating? And that's something that I'm still really grappling with of, um, you know, I'll see these little kids praying and it's like the sweetest thing, but then I'm back in my head like, but do they know what they're doing? Um, None of us do. <laughs> and so there's, there's small things where I just, yeah, where I'm just like, I want this to be her choice. I want her to choose it. I don't want her to feel like it was chosen for her. I don't want her to enter into this world that she doesn't want to be in. And I think those are all things that we have to deal with as parents is like, what is best for our child? And how do we allow them to have autonomy and independence? And yeah, so I think just having space for her to be free and to ask questions and to communicate what she needs and to be willing to listen to those things, even if sometimes they don't always fit my framework. Yeah, yeah, that's so true. Um, it, it's it's tricky. It's definitely tricky once you have a, a tiny person who's sort of depending on you and and you're sort of sort of juggling this thing where you don't want to inflict the same things that that you had to struggle through, uh, but still provide some sort of structure. And you know, it's a delicate balance for sure. Um, one of the things I kind of want to sort of uh, end on is one of the things I, I think is really important, especially when we talk about like mental illnesses and, and, and things like that. Um, you, like your story is really like one of like um, I, I, uh, success is not the right word, but um, um, like accomplishment. Like you had all these barriers and obstacles, and yet you know, you've you flourished in your life. And, um, and I think too often people think, well, I, I was diagnosed with X, Y, or Z, and, and so therefore I can't I can't fulfill the dreams that I. I, I once wanted to, and maybe it does look a little bit different depending on the issue, but, but ultimately you were able to, you know, travel your, your, your path and, and, and come out the other end and do the thing, you know, be a successful writer and things like that. Um, you know, so talk about like, I, I think that's important to know for people out there who maybe are struggling with, with different things. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I worked in the mental health field for a little bit and something that was really hard for me, and I think the difference between a good and toxic mental health worker is people believing that people with mental illness are resilient and can live meaningful and hopeful lives. And I think that was really hard for me in treatment was I didn't know what kind of life I could live, especially in college when we're dealing with what our future looks like. No one could tell me what my future and what I was capable of. And it, I often felt like mental health workers were just treating me like the biggest thing I could do is get out of bed. And sometimes that's all I could do. Um, and when I was not depressed, it's like I felt like I had to overcompensate for before I fall into another depression. But there was a part of me just thought recovery was a matter of a destination and that once I got there, I would stay there forever. So when I was 18, I promised myself, okay, I'm going to write this book. I'm going to get a book deal by the time I'm 30. I accomplished all of that. Um, I, I, I just kept pushing myself and pushing myself. And that was what got me through really hard seasons. And I thought, okay, because I did this, 
that means it's all, it's all the clear for the rest of my life. And at that point, like I had done so much work and therapy and all these things. And so I I just thought everything was coming together and that was that. And I think I got to that point because I had so many people that really believed in me and in college, I had professors calling me to go to class. I had psychiatrists telling me success stories. Like, I didn't know if it was true, but I had to keep pushing myself. Um, but then I was in, like, the actual editing process, and everything kind of hit the fan. Like, I had my daughter. I fell into a really deep depression. Like, I had never experienced even worse than in my book. Like, it ended with me in a psychiatric facility. And I just remember being, like is this all being taken away and I'm going, am I going to end up back to where I was in the book? Um, like, is this the new low? And I think the thing that's really helpful for me is like, yes, I still experience these symptoms and things linger, but because of all I've learned throughout my life, I experience it differently. And like, yes, there are days where I'm like, I can't get through this. Like there's no way, but I'm occupying the world and I'm experiencing these things in a different way. And um, I think when I was younger, I very much viewed pain-free life as the solution to everything. And I thought that was the purpose of life. And I think as I've lived with this illness, as hard as it is, being in the dark for so long, it makes you notice glimpses of light and it makes you notice God and it makes you notice hope in new ways. And I think for me, like, even though the last three years have been the hardest of my life, it's like, because of what I've experienced, I'm allowed, allowing myself to feel the pain and not repress it. But I'm also allowing myself to feel joy and feel hope and feel these things and allowing those things to coexist. And I think that's really what life is about. It's not about um, chasing good feelings. It's like, I never want to look away from the pain of the world. I never want to forget about that because it's part of what makes us human, but it can coexist with, um, a deeper meaning, a deeper hope. And, um, I think I've just had to have a lot more grace with myself that like there is value and there is meaning and there is beauty, even in the seasons when getting out of bed is hard and, and, and that alone, choosing to get out of bed and choosing to be alive. Those are all acts of faith. And so, I think recontextualizing what I think about faith, what I think about the meaning of life, that 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 has really helped me occupy it in a different way. And yeah, that's that's so like that's such a a great thing to hear. I think for a lot of people out there, I think I think it's hard. We don't often have grace for ourselves, and and you're right. Sometimes like you know, a, a, a victory is 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 just putting one leg in front of the other and getting out of bed. Um, that day. And sometimes that's enough, you know, and and we, we have to adjust our expectations. Like, Hey, today, you know what? Like just putting pants on, (laughs) you know, was, was enough and that's okay. Um, and, and giving ourselves a little, a little leeway there, I think. Well, thank you so, so much. The book is fantastic. People should go out and get, it's called devout, a memoir of doubt. Um, it is available everywhere. Books are sold. Um, tell people where they can stay up on top of, uh, what you're up to. I'm on Twitter, Anna slash Gazmarian, and then a Gazmarian. Beautiful. On well, pe- uh, I'll put the uh, the links in the show notes as usual, so people go go follow and and go check out the book. And um, again, as we talked about at the top, like we're such huge proponents of of mental health here and getting rid of the stigma and and taking away that you know that that thing that obstacle that seems to stand in the way of so many people just getting the help that they need and and getting to a place where they they can just feel better. And, um, you know, I tell people all the time, I'm not ashamed. Uh, like I was initially, I I remember I was first diagnosed with depression, um, and, and, and tried some antidepressant medications. I couldn't even tell, like I was in like a Bible study group. I couldn't even tell them, you know, it took everything just to like admit that, um, as if like I fell short in some way, but now it's just like, you know, I I'll tell anybody who listens, like, you know, medication for everybody, you know, depending on your situation. But for me, it was like completely a game changer. I, I will never go back to the way I felt pre pre medication. Like for me, I, I need a combination of therapy and, and meds. And so, um, people should not be ashamed and, and they should, should get the help they need. Yeah. I also think it, it is helpful. The older you get with a diagnosis that like, uh, your, your identity isn't fully in your mental illness. And I think 
getting a diagnosis and having to spend so much time in it, it's very easy to make that everything, and it's really not. It's It does integrate into the rest of your life, and it's important to pay attention to those other things, too. Church, what have we done? No church. When will we ever see? Until we're all treated the same and nobody is actually free. Let that be 